Okay, so I'm gonna, we're going to get started. So welcome to the, the third uh, QCRG uh, uh, town hall. Um, we've had two previous ones over the last several months. Um, this one today, we're going to focus on the last four subgroups. And here's a, um, a picture of all the PIs at um, UCSF and QBI and beyond that are um, affiliated uh, with uh, a QCRG. Uh, and here are the 12 subgroups. So we've um, heard from eight of the subgroups uh, so far. And uh, today we're going to be hearing about the, the last four. Um, first one led by Pedro Baltreo talking about bioinformatics and systems biology. He's going to go through some um, new interesting data sets that we've uh, compiled. And then Tanya and Andre are going to be talking about modeling and mechanism, followed by Martin Campman, who's leading the genetic subgroup. And then finally, um, Todd and Bruce will be talking about some cardiovascular work that um, they're involved in. And um, I'd encourage anybody listening that wanted to get involved in these subgroups or any of the subgroups to reach out to the subgroup um, uh, leaders um, in uh, the future. And the way we're going to do this is uh, each group is going to have uh, 10 minutes uh, to present. And then at the end, we're going to take questions. And um, I'm going to ask everybody to um, type into the Q&A, their uh, questions, uh, and then we'll get to them um, at the end. Uh, so why don't we get started? First up, um, uh, Pedro Beltreo uh, will be talking about um, systems biology and uh, bioinformatics. So go ahead, Pedro. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, so if you can hear me well and you can see the presentation, what I'm going to do for the next 10 minutes is uh, tell you about this uh, story about comparing interaction networks for different coronaviruses to try to understand what are common mechanisms. And as Devin said, I will be mostly telling you about what the data that's being produced, give a little bit of sort of uh, overall analysis, but I'm not gonna go into many uh, specific details, molecular details. And so as you all know, there's been uh, three uh, coronavirus that, that uh, have uh, pathogenicity in humans, SARS-1, SARS-2, and MERS. And they broadly have a similar genomic organization. They share many proteins, in particular non-structural proteins and uh, structural proteins. And what I'm going to show you here briefly is just the differences, in particular from these accessory factors, which are shown here for MERS and in COV1 relative to COV2. And of course, there's also sequence divergence. So even for the proteins that are the same, which we call orthologs across the same virus, across the different viruses, they may still diverge in sequence, uh, sequence residues. So from a, a more global perspective, besides the therapeutics, what, by comparing these three viruses, we may be able to also better understand the relationship between the viral sequence evolution, selection in the hosts, and how this in turn relates to differences in, in, in pathogenicity or conserve or differences in, in host targeting systems. So among these differences in evolution, which could with some of the consequences that could lead molecularly to so changes in protein localization or changes in viral uh, host interactions. Of course, once we look at the conserved targeted systems, this may help us to better understand uh, where, what would be drugs that could target the future coronaviruses or drugs that would be less likely to lead to drug resistance. So this is really the focus of this project. And in the context of this project, here, here's probably the most important slide, is to tell you about the data that has been generated. From on one hand, uh, you, of course, you know about the previous study doing the protein interaction map between the virus proteins and the host proteins for SARS-CoV-2. In this study, this is now complemented by the same approach done for COVID-1 and MERS. This is a work by David Gordon and Daniel Sweeney. These were expressed in HEC-293 cells, uh, pulled down for mass spectrometry analysis. So we have a, a fairly comprehensive map for the three viruses for each of the individually expressed pro viral proteins. At the same time, each of the viral proteins was uh, tagged with a marker, and uh, this was allowed for visualization by, by microscopy. And so for each of the viral proteins, we have the in vivo cell localization of the expressed protein. And in parallel to this, uh, for the interactive proteins of SARS-2, there's been a comprehensive CRISPR and RNA uh, study done to understand which of these genes is required, which of the host genes is required for proliferation. So I'm going to tell you now a little bit about sort of the overall analysis that was done uh, using these data. And so I'll start by just giving you again the information about the localization. So this, there were two types of localizations that were done for the three viruses 
each of the viral proteins was expressed with a strep tag and then visualized inside the host cell in, in HeLa cells. And this allows us to say how conserved is the localization of each of the viral proteins. So if the same protein in different viruses, to which extent this is a conserve. For a, a smaller number, 14 of the SARS-CoV-2 proteins, we, we were able to use antibodies to look in the context of infection where the protein is. And this allows us to say for at least these 14 proteins, how different is the localization of the singly expressed protein versus the protein in the context of infection. It's work done by Robert Cross's lab and Andrew Pandon's lab. And Svenja uh, did a really large effort on this on the immune, uh, on the context of infection part. So I'm not gonna go into details. The, here we have all the viral proteins for the three viruses. Here's just one example in the context of infection for ORF3A showing these endosomal localization, stain with a marker, counter stain with a marker to, to be assured that this is the actual localization that we're looking at. And we summarize these in these tables where in the bluish colors, we have the, the localization of the proteins expressed one at a time. And for the ones in SARS-CoV-2 where we, we could do it in the context of infection, we have these uh, boxes here to indicate the localizations in the context of infection. There are two take home messages from this. If you look at the, the same protein in the different viruses, you typically see the same localization. So therefore, if there are changes in mechanisms, these are not likely to be driven by changes in protein localization. Another take home message is, is that of sometimes the, the context of infection, the protein is localized differently. The biggest differences seem to be where you have diffuse cytoplasmatic localization in the absence of infection, and you now have a punctide uh, cytoplasmatic uh, localization in the context of infection, which may relate to uh, the recruitment to replication factories uh, as an example, but there could be other explanations for this. And so uh, this is uh, to tell you that we don't think changes in mechanisms are likely to be strongly driven by changes in localizations across the viruses. So then we can look specifically at the interaction of the viral host interaction networks for the three viruses, and we can divide these into conserved across the three, conserved across pairs, so such as SARS-1 and 2, or specific to say, for example, only MERS. And, and from here we can, I, again, there's a lot to go into here just to say some examples of, of processes that are conserved across the three viruses, conserved between SARS-1 and 2, but not MERS, as an example of a process that's uh, more specific to, to, to MERS, for example. There was an interesting uh, point to this is also that we can look at then in each of the viral baits and ask, are, are some of the baits more likely to be having conserved interactions than others? So for example, if we look at things that are conserved, interactions that are conserved across all the three viruses, then proteins such as NSP13, NSP11, NSP7 and 8 are, are those that are most likely to have conserved interactions across all three. And so then this begs the question, this must be encoded in the sequence as well. There must be something in the sequence that encodes the, the fact that these are likely to be conserved across the three. And in fact, uh, we did find this. So if you just compare, in this case, the, NS, the, the SARS-CoV-2 protein sequence against the SARS-CoV-1 or MERS in these two colors, here we're plotting for each protein, we're plotting the sequence conservation. On the other axis, we're just plotting the, the, the degree of conservation, so the overlap of interactions between the viruses. And you see uh, actually a, a really nice relationship between the sequence conservation of the protein sequence and the conservation of the interaction partners that they have. And unexpectedly, of course, between SARS-1 and 2, you have a higher degree of conservation, both at the sequence level and the interaction level, but, but you see this general trend. And then you can look across the, off the diagonals to find examples such as NSP13, which has a higher degree of overlap of interaction that one might expect by its interaction, by its uh, sequence conservation patterns as examples. And so one other thing that we noted though is despite the fact that there are changes in specific interactions, sometimes the viruses will still interact with the same biological processes. And this is the analysis that Merv did that sort of summarizes this really well. So here we have all the cases where we have significant uh, enrichment of these processes across the three viruses. But then you can see here the degree of gene overlap. And for some of these processes, such as in the nuclear envelope, the three viruses interact with nuclear envelope proteins, but not necessarily by the same proteins. And here is just a, a, an illustration of this fact, where you have for each of the colors, you have the different viruses or combinations of viruses. And you see that for SARS-1, 2, and MERS, you have interactions with the nuclear envelope proteins, but 
via quite distinct uh, proteins. So finally, uh, for the SARS-CoV-2 proteins, there's been, been extensive uh, sRNA and CRISPR knockout screens. Uh, these were validated uh, using uh, SC2 as a, as, a, as a positive control. And uh, um, again, I'm not going to go into the details of this, uh, just to, we can map these out and show, in this case, we have the, the viral proteins of the three viruses to help you see uh, which of these target proteins is conserved across the three or more specific to say SARS-1 and 2 or just SARS-2. And then each of these is either uh, important such that if you take it out, it decreases in effectivity in blue or it increases effectivity in orange-red uh, colors. Uh, so there's really a lot to be mined from here. Of course, the interesting things here would be potentially things that conserve across all the three and required for infection. So these would be fantastic candidates for, for things, therapeutics that will be conserved across three. Just to point out two examples of interest, so you have SIGMAR1 that was already noted in the first paper that it's conserved between COVID-1 and 2, and it shows here as, a, as important for infection. We're pointing out here one that's important for, well, it's only interacting with SARS-CoV-2, but we have interesting uh, patient data that suggests that it, in human individuals, a, a similar decrease in ER70 receptor is actually protective uh, uh, for the disease. And so in summary, we can identify these conserved regulatory processes such as a cell cycle regulation microtubules or nuclear envelope interactions, but these conserved processes not, do not always go through the same interactions or even by the same bioproteins. Sequence variation, but not protein localization, appear to determine these changes in interactions. And we have now this collection of conserved and required genes and processes it would be quite interesting to explore for therapeutics. Okay, great. Thank you, Pedro. Um, again, if anyone has questions for Pedro or any of the speakers, please put them in the Q&A box and we'll get to them at the end. And we will now transition to the second talk. It's a tag team with uh, Tanya and Andre. Okay, can you see my slides okay and hear me? Great. Okay, great. Um, so I'm representing the QCRG Modeling and Mechanism Group. Um, there are many people who contribute to the work in our discussions, some of whom are listed here, and in particular interactions with uh, really many of the different subgroups, in particular the QCRG Structural Constitution, I'd like to highlight here. So what I thought I'll do today is to give you a short vignette on modeling and how it can um, help us understand the virus and an early mechanistic hypothesis that we had and an update on what happened to that. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about computational design of inhibitors of SARS-CoV-2 infection and then I'm gonna hand it over to Andre. Um, so, so here's the update. Um, this is about um, a, hypo a hypothesis that Chris Matthew came up with in the original paper um, with Dave Gordon and others, where one of the strong interactions that was identified was the interaction of R6 with this messenger RNA export complex. There was no structural information on this potential interaction, but what Chris noticed is that there was a structure of the complex um, with a um, fragment from a completely different viral protein from a completely different virus. And there was no um, similarity or obvious structural similarity between R6 and this uh, VSVM protein. But Chris noticed that there was a sequence motif that appeared to be conserved in SARS-CoV-1 and CoV-2 um, that could be aligned with this viral M protein here. And in particular, there was a conserved methionine residue here that seemed to be important for this interaction. Again, or 6 and this viral M protein are structurally unrelated. And so that led to the hypothesis that um, mutation of this methionine could be used to study the potential importance, biological importance of this interaction. And that was in fact uh, recently confirmed um, in this study that appeared in BioArchive about a month ago, where precisely the single mutation of that methionine to alanine dramatically affected the interaction with the nuclear export complex and then could be studied to confirm the importance of this interaction in uh, nucleocytoplasmic transport. And we're now very curious, this is of course one of the major targets for the QCRG structure consortium to get more structural information since OR6 is so different structurally uh, from the M protein to see whether that can help us with additional mechanistic hypotheses um, on this particular biological consequence of this interaction. 
Um, and then secondly, I would like to talk about a computational design effort um, to identify or to design um, inhibitors of SARS-CoV-2 infection. And this was led by a fantastic team, um, Adam Glasgow, who is in my lab, um, and Jeff Glasgow, who is in Jim Wells' lab, in collaboration with other groups at UCSF and elsewhere. Um, and this work um, was posted on BioArchive about a month ago. And you can see here all the people, um, the, the, the really fantastic team who contributed to this work. So we all know that SARS-CoV-2 infection begins with an interaction of the viral spike protein with the um, receptor on, sorry, with the receptor on human cells, the ACE2 receptor. And so the key idea here was to make soluble and high affinity versions of ACE2 receptor that could trap the virus and prevent it from interacting with the membrane-bound human ACE2 receptor. And we thought that this was going to be um, a useful um, strategy to pursue because solu the soluble domain of ACE2 was already found to be safe in humans. And in fact, um, it is in phase two clinical trials for um, COVID-19. Um, however, the affinity of wild type ACE2 to the spike receptor binding domain or RBD um, is modest. It's only in the 10 to 20 nanomolar affinity range. Um, there is a structure available um, posted in the PDB of the ACE2 extracellular domain shown here in purple and the spike receptor binding domain um, shown here in brown. And um, Adam was able to use this structure as a basis for computational design to see whether um, she could, using Rosetta, predict variants of this interaction that would increase the affinity. And so she identified in particular um, a region um, within that interface that looked like it could be computationally remodeled and came up with um, two computational designs, a very conservative single amino acid mutation um, and then a triple mutation in ACE2 that I'm calling computational design two here. Um, and that will be the basis for the results that I'm gonna show you um, in the rest of the presentation. Um, so Alan, in collaboration with Jeff, could then show that these ACE2 proteins could be displayed on yeast and tested for binding with the spike receptor binding domain. And that is, of course, useful then to use the capability of yeast display to also optimize these constructs. And so what you see here are titrations done at the surface of yeast. Um, looking at binding to the spike RVD, you see the wild type ACE2 construct here um, in blue. And the computational design, too, already quite dramatically increases the affinity. And that affinity can then be further optimized up to about 170-fold um, in yeast display um, by starting with libraries from the computational design, too. And I'm going to be particularly focusing on um, two variants here, again, the computational design, too, um, as well as one of the optimized variants based on this design coming out of yeast display, because that turned out to be the protein that could most stably be expressed. Um, but the lowest apparent affinities that we're getting here, um, at least from this assay, are in the hundreds of picomolar range. Um, so then these um, affinity an increased variance um, could be further engineered first by dimerizing them and that could be done by linking them to a natural ACE2 dimerization domain, this collectron domain shown here in yellow, as well as then fusing them with a human FC domain as commonly done um, in um, human protein or in, in protein therapeutics. And these proteins, these constructs can be stably expressed um, and can be tested in vitro. And so I'm going to show you here um, a really quite remarkable in vitro result with purified components, looking at binding of computational design two to full length trimeric spike protein in vitro. Um, this is from um, biolayer interferometry results. So you see here at different concentrations, the association of the two proteins. But then what's particularly remarkable about this result is if you look at this dissociation phase, it's essentially completely flat. So we cannot observe in this experiment that the computational design actually comes off the spike protein. And we cannot use these data to estimate the affinity um, that is uh, really high. And then finally, of course, we were interested in seeing whether these um, engineered ACE2 variants or receptor traps indeed efficiently neutralize SARS-CoV-2. 
um, and we did that in collaboration, both um, using a pseudotype virus assay as well as authentic virus and BSL-3 conditions. Um, so first on the left here, um, in blue, the first bar here, um, this is a monomeric original wild type construct that I mentioned in the beginning. Um, it is more efficient um, once you use the fused and dimerized construct, but you can see a dramatic increase in neutralization here, both from the computational design shown here in yellow, as well as from this affinity matured version in yeast. Um, and you can also see uh, similar results from the authentic virus um, assays here. Again, two straight out of computational design being rather potent, um, as well as the affinity. Um, optimized mutant. So we're excited that um, the strategy seems to give us potent neutralizing receptor traps. Uh, we're hoping these might be robust to viral escape mutations because they're working by the same mechanism that the virus needs to use to bind to ACE2. We could also show in data that I did not show you that the variants also bind to SARS-CoV-2 um, and NL63 spike proteins. Uh, we are excited because this could be combined with antibody or nanobased nanobody-based inhibitors developed um, at UCSF and elsewhere. Um, as I said, ACE2, the wild type, has already been shown to be safe in humans. We're hoping to extend the strategy to other human receptors and, of course, collaborate with the QCRG Structure Consortium um, to help us in engineering these and other receptor traps. And I would just like to end with a timeline just to showing how fast projects like these can develop if a team works on this. So we started this project in mid-March. About a week later, we had the computational designs. A couple of weeks later, the first experimental results. Then at the end of the month, um, the first optimizations um, from yeast display. Shortly afterwards, the first neutralization results. And essentially within two months, um, finished designs of the construct. And then, as I said, um, the uh, manuscript was posted on BioArchive at the beginning of August. And with this, I'll turn it over to Andre. Andre, I think you're muted. That is a rookie mistake. Um, uh, sorry about that. I'd like to begin uh, very brief remarks. I'd like to begin by bringing to your attention a, a, a recent paper uh, led by John Aitchison in Seattle to which we contributed in a small way. In this paper, the uh, traditional concept of synthetic lethality, to which uh, you know, Nevin contributed so much, was uh, expanded or generalized uh, to virus host systems with hopefully uh, some advantages in uh, uh, selecting particularly suitable targets for drug discovery. Uh, the idea, as you can imagine, is that um, as the uh, virus uh, infects the cell, um, it pushes the cell to a different state, infected state, that uh, is distinct from a normal state or normal states of the cell. And therefore, one can see uh, or one can view this state in combination with an additional perturbation, say with a small molecule or any kind of a drug, as the combination of the two factors that together are lethal the synthetic lethality, in other words. So this paper discusses this, um, um, some examples and so on, and the hope is that this may provide an additional perspective to facilitate um, particularly uh, suitable target selection strategies. And maybe um, people uh, interested in that in our consortium uh, could um, exploit this, and we are happy to talk about this further if need be. That's the first point. Then two additional points I'd like to make, uh, super fast, um, forward looking, not really um, uh, impressive in the sense of providing any current results uh, like Tanya's presentation was. But first, um, we are um, interested in mapping uh, as comprehensive as possible the network um, of protein and small molecule interactions 
uh, between the virus and the human cell. And in order to do that, we are developing what we call an Bayesian integrative network modeling method that can take into account a lot of different types of information about networks. One particularly interesting type of information that we have lined up uh, is going to come from large-scale proteolysis, limited proteolysis experiments performed with Paula Picotti and also uh, by Monita and Nevin's group and Bill DeGrado is involved as well. And so we are asking people, we are telling people about this effort, existing effort, um, um, and asking people for ideas and interest if, if they are um, willing to engage uh, by providing data or ideas. Um, Aji Pallar in our group is the point person for that. And along similar lines, uh, second advertisement, I guess, I guess third advertisement very briefly, we do have uh, apparently a significantly improved computational integrative structure modeling method that benefits from electron microscopy density maps at about three to seven up to eight angstrom resolution or so where you need to thread a sequence through related perhaps remotely related known structures or structure fragments that you can fit into the map but don't know exactly where the sequence goes and so we can sample uh, the structural space of solutions with this new EM based integrative modeling approach supported by additional information if available in order to get structural models that are more accurate, precise, and complete um, than the existing protocols are available. And we are dying to get our hands on um, applications, uh, you know, data sets that you guys are generating uh, to prove that we can help with our approach. So that's the third advertisement uh, I'd like to make. The point person in our lab is Daniel Salzberg. Um, who, bo both Aji and Daniel are uh, participating in this in these meetings. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Tanya and Andre. If you want to stop sharing, uh, we'll now transition to Martin Katman. We'll talk about some genetic work that's ongoing with SARS-CoV-2. Great. Um, I think you can see my screen now, right? Looks great. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm super excited um, to um, uh, launch together with uh, um, many others here the uh, QCRG genetics subgroup. Um, and um, what I see as kind of the, the role of the genetic subgroup within the larger consortium is twofold. One, discovery. So we can use genetic screens um, as a novel way to, to uh, uncover um, either um, Inter functionally relevant interactions between the virus and the host cells, and also as a way to, to de novo dis uh, discover therapeutic targets. So I think um, Andre already uh, hit on the concept of synthetic lethality, the fact that we might find genetic changes in viral infected cells that can be exploited therapeutically. Um, and Pedro already also um, uh, pointed uh, to the fact that genetic interactions between um, viral proteins uh, and the host cells are kind of complementary to protein-protein interactions. And we're really excited with, with Nevin and others to integrate kind of protein-protein interactions with genetic interactions in that way. However, the other aspect of the genetics group is that we can also contribute to work from all the other subgroups by helping to test mechanistic hypotheses in cells where we can, for example, manipulate some of the uh, factors and, and look in the context of the cell at uh, impact on different stages of viral infection and life cycle um, and test predicted functional roles of, of specific physical interactions. Um, so um, I will mention work that my lab has been involved in, but as I, as I said, the genetics group obviously is, is bigger than that. And Pedro mentioned some beautiful genetic work that he and Nevin's group have, have also been uh, involved with. So in my lab, um, a group of trainees, Ray Lin Tian, Ari Samuelson, Melissa Chen, Gokul Ramados, who's in fact uh, joined with um, Bruce Conklin's lab and thereby also um, provides a, a bridge with the um, 
Kalyu subgroup we'll hear about, and Shayan Go have all been um, uh, excited um, during the COVID shutdown to actually start a COVID research project um, that I will, I will tell you about. But I also want to mention that this already was a highly collaborative project, uh, and we have a number of, of interlocking projects here. One um, project I will not talk about today, but hopefully soon, is a collaboration both with Nevin's lab and with Marco Vinucci at the Institut Pasteur, where we're working with them to do a um, modifier screen based on um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. There have been a number of screens in the meantime that were published by different groups. And um, intriguingly, some of them showed relatively little overlap. So this is kind of a deja vu from some of the initial uh, RNAi screens based on HIV. Um, you know, and, and I think there will be some cell type specificity for how you do it. And as I show in a minute, um, our approach is based on CRISPR I, CRISPR A, will, which potentially has um, has different ways of detecting relevant therapeutic targets and and hit genes. And I should also mention that we've already in our current work um, um, have interactions with Jim Wells Group, Bruce Conklin's Group, um, also with Synthego and and Jonathan Weisman, as I point out. Um, so for the genetics tools, one of the central um, technologies is that we're able to um, manipulate gene function in the context of human cells um, using CRISPR technology, which needs no introductions, and two other technologies that I mentioned that we co-developed with a team of people here at UCSF, CRISPR-I and CRISPR-A screening, um, ways that utilize a catalytically dead uh, version of Cas9 to recruit transcriptional repressors and activators, which allows you to really tune up and down expression of, of human endogenous genes over many orders of magnitude in order to then evaluate their roles in cellular processes. And we believe that this is a great way to actually model, for example, therapeutic interventions where you might have only a partial um, uh, loss of function of the targeted protein. Um, when we started out this project, we were not able to work with SARS-CoV-2 in, in our lab specifically, so we thought about ways that we could build a cell-based phenotype that we could screen and that would be meaningful. And uh, we decided to look at one of the first steps that, that's um, clearly going to be really important for infection, which is binding of the virus to the cell surface, uh, which we know to be um, mediated in large part by the spike protein binding to ACE2, as we heard about, and that's confirmed by infection screens where knockdown of ACE2 is often the strongest way to block infection. Um, and, we, we, uh, and, and this was a great interaction with Jim Wells' lab, who had made recombinant constructs based on this uh, spike proteins and the spike protein receptor binding domain um, that showed in vitro uh, binding to ACE2. And so that was something we could work with in the lab to use it as a, as a, as a probe for um, spike protein or spike RBD binding to cell surfaces. First, we wanted to find a cell line that endogenously expresses enough receptor and shows specific binding of this. And we screened a number, uh, actually, you know, um, a half a dozen cell line at least. And um, what we found is that um, this, this axis should say log uh, nanomolar of the receptor binding domain. Um, so we found nanomolar affinity in Kalu3 cells, uh, maybe not surprisingly, given their lung, um, uh, uh, lung provenance. Um, but other cell lines only showed non-specific binding that was really not saturable. Um, we also validated in Kalu3 cells by making knockout cells for ACE2 that um, this was completely depending on ACE2. So we decided to do um, a genetic screen in Kalu3 cell lines because we were really interested to find endogenous mechanisms that would regulate cell surface levels of ACE2 and maybe other determinants that control spike protein bindings, maybe co-receptors, um, post-translational modifications of ACE2. And we wanted to do this in a cell where ACE2 is under endogenous control, so we understand endogenous um, regulatory mechanisms. So we, um, uh, we were able to uh, complete a first pilot screen. The Weizmann lab had actually made a CRISPR-I version of the Kalu3 cell line, so we were able to use that and uh, we infected it with one of our CRISPR-I libraries that targets the druggable genome and also all kinases and phosphatases, so a great starting point for therapeutic target discovery. And we conducted two parallel fax-based screens 
One of them was based on binding of the uh, spike protein um, uh, FC biotinylated version that we received from Jim Wells' lab, detecting it with fluorescent streptavidin, and then sorting cells based on the amount of, um, of uh, spike protein binding that we detected by flow cytometry into high and low bands, and then using next generation sequencing to ask, are there any genes that when knocked down give you more or less spike protein binding? We also realized that a screen like that could have a lot of generic uh, confounders, things that affect things like cell size or that in very general ways affect protein synthesis or something about membrane proteins. So we did a, in parallel a counter screen for the transferrin receptor um, using a good antibody for transferrin receptor binding that we had um, also validated to be highly specific um, to just be able to filter out genes that were very generic and not specific to, uh, to controlling spike protein binding. Um, this is the data from the first pilot screen and uh, we found a number of hits both that decrease and increase um, binding of the uh, spike protein. Um, and I'm not showing that today, but when we overlaid the data for the transferrin receptor, many, many genes are very specific for either transferrin receptor or uh, spike protein binding. So um, uh, implicating that these are actually in very independently controlled. And the top hit was ACE2. So again, a very satisfactory way that, that to, to show us that our screen is picking up on the right things. But there were a few other hits that were almost as potent as ACE2 knockdown in abrogating uh, spike protein binding. And we just started uh, in, uh, over the last week or so to validate them, both the positive and negative hits uh, with individually cloned guide RNAs. And you can see that we are definitely able to find um, guides that, that give much, much higher protein binding of the, the spike, uh, spike proteins in cells. So this is certainly could be a way to transform a cell that's normally not infectable by, by the virus into an infectable cell. But we're obviously more interested therapeutically in the opposite. And this was not one of the strongest hit genes. We, we were cloning them as, and, and testing them as we, as we went along. Um, uh, but you can definitely see a very significant reduction in, in spike protein binding, knocking down a splicing factor. And of course, now we are at the stage of testing hypotheses. Is this directly affecting, for example, a splicing of ACE2? And could that be a mechanism that regulates isoforms, trafficking, stability, uh, cell surface localization? Um, so again, we are at the next steps of validating HIT genes. Um, for some of them, there are possible pharmacological ways to validate them and target them as well, which we're very excited about because that would broaden us to, to using it in, in animal models and other infection models. Um, we're interested in elucidating the mechanism of action. So first of all, asking, is this affecting overall transcriptional levels of ACE2 message? Is it affecting protein levels? Is it affecting just cell surface localization? Or are there some novel unknown mechanisms that might be ACE2 independent that, uh, that are at play here? And then again, we'd love to collaborate to test the impact on infection as well. Um, so just to wrap up, um, we're very excited to um, look at um, interactions between genetics and, um, and, and other subgroups um, from our end please reach out to us if you have ideas for genetic experiments that we can help with, hypotheses that we can help test. And of course, we also hope to collaborate uh, on mechanisms um, and therapeutic targeting for some of the hits that we have found already. And we hope to identify more in these other screens as well that I mentioned working, for example, with Nevin and Marco Vinici. All right, fantastic, Martin. That's great, um, really exciting stuff. Uh, that's the future here, but we gotta get on board this train. Uh, so then we'll transition to the last uh, talk with Todd and um, Bruce. They're going to be talking about some recent work that they've um, put on by our archive with cardiovascular um, connection to SARS-CoV-2. And I think I got some recent data just this morning from uh, Canada that they're going to be talking about. Yeah. Th thanks, Nevin. This has been, uh, I think as most people just can describe, this has been a whirlwind since March. Uh, I wish I had the timeline of, of events and things like uh, Tanya did for her team. But uh, this all started like many good things in research. This all started with uh, Bruce <laughs> and, and Melanie and great collaborations uh, there. Um, so let me just jump right into it. And as Nevin said, uh, I'm going to hit just highlights. There's a lot of data on this that I'm not going to have time to show that is in the um, uh, reprint or preprint. And we actually already have updates to that that'll be reposted today before we submit. 
So uh, early on in this, uh, Bruce in particular, talking with cardiology colleagues, had, no had heard that there were signs of cardiac distress at the very least in several patients that were starting uh, to be hospitalized. And um, in particular, what was alarming was that the, a number of patients, 20, 30%, were having high levels of, uh, or this high sensitivity for troponin I in the blood. That troponin, cardiac troponin I only leaks out when there's been myocardial damage. And so it's one of the best clinical indicators uh, and high sensitivity for this that they can measure at very low levels. Um, it's usually associated with folks that have uh, my, uh, myocardial infarction and you see this transient um, uh, spike in, that, in their blood. Uh, in addition, some of the early reports out of China that did some calculation of this predict or could demonstrate that actually uh, mortality was 10 to 20x greater in people that had myocardial injury. And it was actually a greater predictor of mortality than even some of the um, uh, respiratory uh, 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 cases or, or symptoms. Um, more recently, in about a month or two ago, over the last two months, there have been more prospective types of studies actually doing um, cardiac functional imaging with either echo or cardiac MRI. In the one case of patients while they were hospitalized that were, that were uh, exhibiting uh, over half of them that had abnormalities in various ways, and there's been several anecdotal reports, and in a lot of the long haulers that are now describing, they get fluttering of their heart, they get sporadic uh, times when their heart rate just surges, and, it's, and most of these folks never had signs of that or any kind of um, pre-existing condition for that. And the other is the cardiac MRI. These were actually patients that were considered, would be considered mild asymptomatic and recovered. And yet more than half actually were again having abnormal MRI. So these reports as they started to pour in and we were in the midst of these studies, this is why I would say um, we felt compelled to put this out as fast as possible. Uh, when I show you some of the results that we were able to obtain in hand, because what has, what has not, what is lagged in this is that autopsy reports for two general features have been they have not been able to detect SARS-CoV-2 in the hearts. Uh, by PCR, it's almost always absent. Um, by any kind of in situ or other immunohistochemical stains, it's also um, uh, cardiac pathologists and others have failed to identify it in the heart. Um, but there are these general diagnoses which um, are, are maybe thought to be viral myocarditis, but this does not look like, while it's been classified sometimes as myocarditis, we were talking with folks even this morning that uh, viral induced heart failure or viral induced cardiac uh, dysfunction might be a more accurate term. So when we set out to, to look at these and even before some of these questions were perhaps better articulated, we had three sort of uh, fundamental things. First of all, which cardiac cells are getting infected? There was tons of speculation at the time and probably still some going on. Uh, so we decided to do a direct head to head using our stem cell modeling uh, platform as a way to do this. Uh, we also wanted to then look at if, it, if, if this uh, if the virus gets into the cell. So IVGI was an acronym used by our team for every caveat for a long time. But the point of this was if it gets in, then what are the uh, adverse effects, particularly looking at this in sort of transcriptional landscape, but then also cytopathic logic or cytopathic effects we could actually visually observe. And then the last one is, um, does any of this matter in the context of we can always you can identify things in vitro, but does any of this actually correlate to the to the disease? So let me go about answering those as quickly as I can with, with um, the data that we have. And again, hopefully we can get a lot of feedback afterwards. So first thing we did uh, was just um, to measure the viral load after infecting. And this was with a very low MOI of 0 0.006, so six vi variants per thousand cells. And this was done intentionally by design um, uh, to start with this sort of low inoculum condition. So and we did this with either the cardiac fibroblast, endothelial cells, or cardiomyocytes that we can derive from human pluripotent stem cells, or we did a mixture. Um, at the outset of this, the thought was there could be maybe synergistic interactions, but what we quickly found in the summary of this is it's the cardiomyocytes that are most infectable, and it's the cardiomyocytes that, as we went on to see, that the virus appears to replicate in the most. And we don't really see this in the cardiac fibroblast or endothelial cells. We do see though that there are cytopathic effects. So even though we can't find detection within the first 48 hours for things such as double-stranded RNA using J2 antibody or spike protein, we do see that the cardiac fibroblasts um, compared to the mock conditions or the endothelial cells start to exhibit cytopathic, uh, sickly looking morphologies, but then also by counts, they die very, very quickly uh, with essentially no cells left in most of these wells by after three days of, of exposure. Um, cardiac myocytes, on the other hand, we still can find many of these, and what you'll see is these sort of centers of uh, what appears almost like replication hubs around this paranuclear appearance around the nucleus, and we could find this 
often in foci, you would see several cells uh, adjacent to one another, but then in regions around it, there might be absence of the virus at that time. So this confirmed to us that the cardiomyocytes were definitely vulnerable, susceptible to infection, and that if they get infected, the virus can definitely uh, replicate very robustly within these cells. But that doesn't appear to be the case for endothelial cells or cardiac fibroblasts, at least using, again, these, these independent cell lines, uh, differentiated phenotypes. So we went a little bit further and we did a, a sort of pseudo time course. We don't have an ability yet to do time lapse imaging we'd like to and with labeled things, we can talk about that at the end, but we did take uh, uh, samples down at different time points. Um, all of this being done by a very um, uh, uh, bold graduate student, Camille Semino, who is in Melanie's group who, who did this, an amazing handoff with the rest of the team going back and forth to conduct the studies and to do all the analysis. Um, and so what we have here is 24, 48 hours, 72, and trying to kind of piece together what the time course of these events might be. We see a lot, of, when we see um, uh, detection of the virus or the viral antigens at 24 hours, it primarily is paranuclear um, localized. We see a more diffuse distribution of this throughout the cytoplasm of many of the cells that seem to be, and we'll get to in a second, deteriorating in several ways. And after 72 hours, we see a loss of a number of cells. We will still see persistence some of this paranuclear in some of the remaining cells. Um, and EM, uh, these studies were done using uh, CLEM technique in collaboration with Ken Nakamura and Hui Hui Lu um, to basically be able to identify those cells. Since not every cell in the culture was infected at once, we had to first to do some immunostaining to identify those of interest, then go back in. And what we could see is we could find these vacuoles uh, containing numerous, uh, uh, what appears to be, um, uh, individual viral particles, and we could find these in many of these, these cells at these sort of sickly or quickly becoming sickly states. So this is also confirmation, and only in the last couple of weeks has there been in vivo confirmation that they can actually detect or find viral particles um, in, a, in a Lancet report in a child. So this brings up a point that it could be, we'll get back to, is that in some of the autopsy specimens, you might actually be missing um, some key uh, or sorry, you might be missing some of the, the, the dynamics of this. Okay, so quickly going through, we looked at some of the entry factors, or say Juan looked at these and looked at perturbations. The takeaway from this, as we know, is that SARS-CoV-2 first binds to ACE2, and then it has to, it either gets in via this uh, cleavage via temporis 2 primarily, or variable endocytosis. And looking at this with a series of small molecules, basically to perturb the elements of this pathway, ACE2 will block viral entry, but it's really these small molecules for, um, that uh, uh, manipulate the viral endocytosis pathway that are responsible for mediating entry um, and, and then going further with that. Let me go quickly through these. So we used the RNA or we used um, uh, transcriptomic approach to be able to look at uh, or to con first confirm and we could first could see is that the, there's an increasing uh, detection of viral reads. Uh, we only see it in the cardiomyocyte samples and we see this with increasing MOI. We also see what's interesting on this, I'll point out, uh, if you can see my mouse on this, is actually this increasing disruption along this axis when we look at the principal components. So while the cell's phenotypes separate themselves as expected, what's interesting is we get this wide spectrum of cardiomyocyte phenotypes that emerges that uh, correlates to the severity of the infection. And when we look at this then and look at some of the GO terms, I'll quickly go through, not surprisingly, we see things such as activation of a new, uh, innate immune response pathways, which is what we would presumably expect. Uh, what's interesting though are some things, two things that there are a couple of things I didn't expect. We do see a lot of changes going on um, in differential regulation with terms that are associated with genes associated with cardiac muscle tissue development, actin filament organization, also nuclear um, membrane integrity and organization. And the other part of this was this ectopic expression of olfactory receptors. Um, I only mention that because of the fact that this has been commonly seen for smell and taste uh, loss of those in patients Again, we know that the heart doesn't taste or smell typically, but the same kind of uh, hundreds of genes associated with those terms are actually being uh, uh, increased in response. Um, let me jump down because I don't want to go too long. That's hard to so the two, wrap up. yep, I'm going to wrap these two. So these were the features we then saw was actually guided by that transcriptomic. We do see this fragmentation pattern that emerges in the cardiomyocytes. And in interestingly, we see these individual units that appear of sarcomeres. When we followed this up, this unusual cleavage with the transcriptomic and the EM, the main takeaway from this is that there is a putative uh, conserved sequence site that appears to be in myosin heavy chain that we think is or could be responsible. And this is some of the studies that are now underway to try and confirm if that's the case. Uh, we also saw loose of nuclear DNA, but the main thing to show you 
were the two or the three patient samples that we have so far. And the main takeaways from these is that we actually can identify, we see in the cases of these, the edema is due to the spacing between myocytes, but we see loss of nuclear DNA in a number of these cells. And we also see by his, uh, H&E, we saw what suggested sarcomeric um, fragmentation, but it was really in the immunostaining results that you actually can start to pull this out. And this is important because it could mean that actually the normal cardiac pathology, when they only look at H&E, it's possible that they may be overlooking this phenotype because you don't see it as robustly and you really have to look under higher magnification. So the takeaways from these is simply, or from these is that we think we've identified and uh, novel features in vitro that we could actually map to phenotypes in vivo. Um, and these might be new indications and unique features. The cardiac pathologists like we spoke to this morning have said they've not seen this in other cases of other, of other myocarditis. And so, uh, we think this might be something new and novel that could be used for screening platform and ways to develop new therapeutics, both for cardiac and cardioprotective drugs. But this could also serve for even more broadly for uh, antiviral types of development. So I'll thank a number of people, I won't have time to mention them all, that have contributed multiple ways to this. Uh, but in particular, this group in particular, who's tirelessly been going in for the last almost six months and have done all of this work. Um, this was a novel collaboration amongst all of these. So I'll stop there. All right, fantastic, Todd. Very exciting. There's lots of synergy that you can see with your work and other yeah. efforts. At so it'll be very exciting to see what happens over that over the next few months. So we have a few um, minutes for questions. I'll try to get to at least one question per group, and we will start with um, Pedro. We'll go back to the beginning. Uh, question from Mehdi. Um, I hope Pedro's still there. Uh, how often do you see switching appraise between non-orthogonal orthologous baits between different viruses? Yeah, this is a great question because I, I didn't get time to go to this, but I did mention that there are oftentimes the same human protein is targeted in the different viruses by potentially different viral proteins. So between SARS-2 and MERS, about 30% of the interacting proteins uh, is the same, but by a different bait. So example being OR4A of MERS interacts with many of the same interaction partners as NSP8 of SARS-2, as an example. Okay, great. he has got another question now for Tanya. Uh, instead of measuring SARS-CoV-2 RNA, have you tried measuring infectious virus using titer-based assays? Could that show even greater antiviral activity? Yes, we a great question. We have not. Um, I think that would be terrific to do. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, got a couple of questions for Martin here. Uh, one from Oren. Uh, what about human genetic variants? Can we think of some human variants as synthetic people with the virus? Do you have an experimental approach to looking at this? Yeah, that's a great question, Oren. We would love to uh, do that um, because absolutely, we do believe that the genetic variants that uh, influence susceptibility to the virus, for example, will have some molecular basis, right? And we'd like to understand that. For some of them, we have other data in patients, for example, about things like ACE2 levels, but um, uh, yeah, we would like to in explore that. And, and there's different approaches to that. We can certainly target their expression levels by uh, CRISPR-I, CRISPR-A. But one of the things that um, my group has become very interested in is to really directly model genetic variants in the context of the genome by exploring prime editing, a new technology that, uh, that probably allows us in high throughput to try to model uh, such genetic variants from humans. So that will be very exciting to, to um, apply. And um, I'd love to team up with other people here in the group who've done more on the bioinformatics sites, uh, looking into human genetics data and, and, and for us to think together about how to test them experimentally. Maybe one more quick question for you, Martin, from Joe. Uh, do you see evidence of proteases that cleave ACE2 and CALO3 cells? Yes, Joe, I think um, this can be a major mechanism to control cell surface levels. The H1 library that we screened did, was not rich in proteases, but I can tell you that in a completely different project, looking at the cell surface expression of an immunotherapy target in cancer cells, some of the strongest hits are in fact exactly that, cell surface proteases that cleave and release receptors and, or, or targets. And, and so that could be another uh, important target, absolutely. And uh, Todd, maybe we could transition to you. Um, sure. uh, uh, anonymous or Andy. HST and I is associated with sepsis even in the absence of myocardial damage. Can cytokine storm the RDS be associated with clinical findings absent of infection? So we are, uh, let me start with the second part of that because the first part I'm not sure. The only, the, the troponin T can only 
clinically come from cardiomyocytes. So to say there's no myocardial damage, I'm not sure that that's true. It could be that there's, it's not an infarction or different types, but a cell has to leak that out in some way for it to get in the blood. At least that's what we've been told by all the clinical colleagues. The cytokine storm, um, yes, we're, we're aware of that. And we actually are trying to, you know, this part is accelerated with the direct viral effects. Um, but we have also in parallel, we have some collaboration going to get actual samples of plasma from myocarditis or COVID-19 and uh, myocarditis are not patients, stratify those and use those as a, as a parallel way to look at potential effects. Uh, but in this case, this is being done, yeah, all in vitro on the, car on the uh, cardiomyocytes. So there's no immune system that can mount the classic cytokine storm. So we think that, the, you know, again, that's, there's, it's an in vitro system. You're always missing something. However, the predictions for the, the pathology were too scarily similar to us in terms of what it could mean. One more question, Todd, for you from Dave. Uh, do you think the pathology and non-infected cell types could be the result of a board of infection? Yeah, this is a great question. So this is uh, one of our biggest question marks. If I did, I had to skip over. Was that the 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 fragmentation, the nuclear loss or DNA loss that we see, is almost always next to cells that have active virus in them, not in them. We have no idea what that means yet, and what that could, what mechanisms might be. And the problem without seeing the time course is, was the virus there already and left, or is it? Uh, some element of the virus could could a protease be shuttled through a, a, a vesicle, and is that getting into cell? There's a, numerous possibilities which we're we're considering how to try and follow up on. All right, very great, great, great science all around, everybody, uh, for this hour. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, we are going to be continuing these town halls in the future. Um, more though, focused on intersection between the different subgroups. Now every subgroup has had a chance to present in this forum. In the future, we're going to be highlighting the the. the the cross pollination um, among the, the subgroups. And we're also, by the end of the year, gonna have another QCRG International Symposium um, focused on SARS-CoV-2 research. We had one a few months ago, it was very successful. It was a worldwide event and there's a 800 participants and we're gonna be planning on having um, another one. And then just the last thing I just wanna highlight that the QBI team has done here is this, um, this QCRG Minute uh, on the QBI TV. Uh, it's a, a one minute um, uh, episode, I guess. Um, we were initially, they initially focused on Ashish and he talked about his uh, nanobody work and now going forward, the QBI TV is gonna be focused on the younger scientists, although Ashish is still young, but it's some of the, the trainees now. And I'd encourage you to be looking for this. I think this is gonna be um, a regular um, uh, event. And I'd encourage you just in general to look at QBI TV for, um, uh, all the things that are ongoing, especially related to uh, COVID-19. And uh, we have one minute to spare. So I'd like to thank everybody uh, for the, again, for these great presentations. And um, I look forward to seeing all of you soon.